I started a cohort-based education business called Going VC uh, with a co-founder, and that business has graduated over 400 people into the ecosystem, and over half of them, after starting the program, have gone into venture roles. So seeing a great success rate there, and just super happy about that because I've always been interested in helping people find jobs, just like something I really, really enjoyed doing. And so now to really have a platform to be able to do that at scale uh, has been has been super exciting. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. This week, I chat with John Gannon, founder of the VC Careers blog and co-founder of Going VC. Now, John has become one of the go-to channels for getting a job in the venture capital space. He started his VC Careers blog shortly after we graduated school together way back when. His blog has scaled and become one of the sources of truth and transparency in the market for VC, listing available jobs, compensation, and much more. In addition to his prolific blogging, John started a very important educational program called Going VC a few years ago. It's super impressive stuff. It was a blast to catch up with John. We discussed a lot, including Going VC, obviously, and other important VC trends. I hope you enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Thunder. Thunder is a platform that is democratizing access to capital. The company believes fundraising should be about who you are and what you've built, not just about who you know. Founders can create a free account and add their company information and then match with relevant investors. Investors can create free profiles and provide their investment criteria, ensuring that they only receive relevant deal flow. By utilizing a double opt-in matching protocol, Thunder avoids the spam, only connecting investors and entrepreneurs that should be introduced. Visit thunder.vc to create your free account while the company is in beta. John, thanks for being here, man. Good to see you. Yeah, you too, Mark. It's uh, it, it's been a while, so it was kind of funny how this came about, and just really glad to be here. It's a great way to catch up, and also hopefully share a few things that can help out your listeners. That's awesome. I'm actually really excited to learn more about what you're doing because I've known about it for a long time, but I don't think I've ever dived all all the way into the weeds. So, with that, do you want to start by giving us an overview of Going VC? Because I think that's your name comes up all the time in regard to that initiative. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about Going VC and maybe a little bit of the origin story, if if that's helpful. Sure, go ahead. So, you know, back when we were in business school, right, together, class of 08 at, at Columbia, we were both looking to break into venture. And back then there was barely any information out there about how to do it, nor were there many people actually trying to break in. And so uh, once I got into the industry after graduating, I basically just started curating resources to help people break into the industry on my my personal blog. And over the years, it's sort of grown and, and turned into uh, multiple businesses, uh, a 20,000 person uh, email list with uh, venture investors and people who are interested in venture investing all around the world from analysts all the way through partner level. And a few years ago, I started a cohort-based education business called Going VC uh, with a co-founder, and that business has graduated over 400 people into the ecosystem, and over half of them, after starting the program, have gone into venture roles. So seeing a great success rate there, and just super happy about that because I've always been interested in helping people find jobs, just like something I really, really enjoy doing. And so now to really have a platform to be able to do that at scale uh, has been has been super exciting. And then adding to that part of the whole educational component, we're teaching people in a 16 week program how to break into venture capital and giving them a lot of the skill sets, tools, exposing them to the right networks, et cetera. One of the things that's super important, as you know, is you want to get some reps in terms of the actual investing process, right? So sourcing companies, mm-hmm. diligence, et cetera. And so we created Going VC Partners, which is an investment entity. We've invested in 20 plus companies. The majority have been sourced by people who have actually gone through the program or alumni. And this year we actually had our first two exits, which we were super excited about. We've got one company in the portfolio that hit unicorn status. So still fairly early, but we're excited about that. 
and yeah, just kind of looking to, to really do more there. There's a lot to unpack there. I love stories when people kind of just stumble into something they care about and turns into a business. Do you want to first give a, a little primer? What's the content? So the 20,000 newsletter subscribers, what are they reading about? Yeah, so each week I'll email a weekly newsletter to my subscribers and the format's pretty standard. I'll start with a bit of an opener. Uh, I'll share some links that I personally read and found interesting over the course of the week. And then I'll have a feature section where it's in essence, almost like a blog post, but I only provide it through the newsletter. I don't actually put it out anywhere publicly. And then I share some venture jobs that were posted in the past week. And, and that's the high level for the newsletter. And then on top of that, I have different products that I'll launch uh, to, to the, the newsletter. Some are products to help people break into venture capital. Others are things like my yearly venture capital salary survey, where mm -hmm. we'll survey my newsletter, we'll get 300, 400 responses from folks actively working in VC, and then we'll transparently share a summary of that data to the market and post it right on my blog. And doing something like that has been super rewarding as well because it's helped uh, both the candidates, but also the firms to really calibrate on like, hey, what is fair, right? I remember back in the day, there was none of that information really available. A firm would say, we'll pay you X. And you said, okay, right? <laughs> you really had no, no leg to stand on. And so now really opening that up has been really empowering. I've gotten emails from, from readers who said like, yeah, you know, because of your, your, your blog post, I was able to get an extra $20,000 of my salary, things like that. Right. And so I just like to be able to level the playing field through things like that. And I have the scale to do that now with the newsletter. So very grateful to my readers who show up every week and, and read my stuff, because without that, I wouldn't really be able to do some of these things to help the broader community. You know, back when we started in the business, it didn't even matter if you knew what market comp was, because I remember when we got out of business school, there were five firms, five major <laughs> firms in New York. Maybe it was a few more. Maybe it was 10. I think you're right. Yeah, it and is probably like closer to five. Yeah. I feel like there was a big <laughs> hiring year in 08, and they hired four people in the entire yeah. city. Yeah. Uh, and it was like four times as big as the prior year. So it didn't matter what you knew about comp. It's either you wanted the job and, or you didn't, because there were 700 people behind you wanted the same job. It was crazy. It yeah, was totally I remember wild. you have that blog, that blog post, uh, you know, the person who gets the job is the last person standing. I remember that one, and it was yeah. totally... Totally, totally right. It still may be right, actually, but there are a lot more jobs now. Yeah, it's more of an industry now with like yeah. some normalcy. I remember when we started business school on day one. You know, I, I was already interning in the space, and so you know, I was pretty passionate about it. And I would walk around business school and be like, "What are you doing?" I was like, I "Really, I'm into this VC thing. I've been interning for a few months now." You know, and I don't know. It must have been fifty, sixty, a hundred people throughout the first month or two of business school told me they were going to be VCs. And at the end, there were only four of us who had passed up all the other jobs and waited it out. <laughs> yeah. So, well done. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I graduated without a job and we were uh, about to have our twins. My, my wife was about to have our twins. And so Crazy. I was just kind of like, trust me, you know, it'll work out. <laughs> and fortunately, I, I ended up with, uh, with a couple of offers and ended up picking the one in, in New York City. So that, uh, that, that worked out. Yeah, geography was playing against us back then. <laughs> right, if you wanted to go to Silicon Valley, there were just way more opportunities. But if you wanted to stay yeah. in New York, you were hard-pressed. Different world now. I've heard the stat that there's over 150 venture firms represented in New York City now, which is a hell of a lot more than there were 15 years ago. Um, yeah. So let's talk about your, your VC entree program. Uh, you, know, you threw out some impressive stats, 400 people going through. 200 people have VC jobs out of that? That's crazy. That's that seems improbable. Even if it's doing, even if it's a really good program, that number seems wrong. What what's happening here? Yeah. So if you think about venture investing roles, right? You've got certainly venture firms, right? You've got corporate VC. Yeah. You've got accelerators that are writing checks, right? Sure. You've got family offices that are doing venture, right? So so those okay, two hundred probably people, defined, right? but that's that's yeah. still relevant. That's a that's yeah. A I mean, are you are, are yeah? Are you writing checks as a you know as a venture investor? Right. That's kind of the the key criteria we use, and we actually we post the statistics on our site publicly, and you can see exactly how we compute that mm. and define that as well. Who gets in, what, what's in the program? What's the what's the content for someone who signs up for this? 
Sure. So for the Going VC program, it's a 16 week program and it comprises a few different components. So the biggest one and the one that we get the most feedback around is really the, the community that we create. You know, everyone is there really focused on that same goal of breaking into the industry or, or up leveling in the industry. And that's something that people at first blush don't really pick up, but I think it's an important point. We have people joining who are like raising their own fund, right? And they see the value as this is going to broaden my network in terms of potential co-investors, potential people who could perhaps write a check into my fund, uh, folks I can collaborate on deal flow. Etc. So we're seeing some of that. And also we are seeing folks who are maybe they're an associate at a firm or they're a senior associate at a corporate venture firm and they're looking to either maybe move across to the other side or move up. And they feel like we provide a great place for that. Well, again, because of the community and the network that going VC and also myself have developed right in the venture world over the last, uh, I guess now it's been, uh, 12, 13 years. And then in terms of the, the programming we have, so there is uh, the 16 week program. We have an educational module each week. So we cover everything soup to nuts that you would need to know about venture from due diligence through cap table modeling and, and, and sort of everything in between. And we bring in industry practitioners for each of those modules. And so if you're doing a session on term sheets, for example, we'll bring in a venture lawyer who that's all they do, right? You're doing a session on diligence. You're going to bring in an investor who has some strong opinions around that to talk to the group. And, you know, we've been able to really get a lot of different folks from different firms uh, in to work with us to, to do these sessions, which I'm super happy about. Cause again, this gives contact to the people in the program with different firms, helps them build their network, right? Et cetera. So we've had folks from firms that, you know, are very small and maybe regional and folks haven't heard of. And then. We've had folks join us from Spark Capital, Redpoint, right? Firms like that as well. So yeah, it's been super exciting to be able to bring that to, to people in terms of the education, but also meeting those practitioners because that, that piece is super important. And then another piece that's critical, as you might imagine, is our career services. So we help with resume review. We can assist with introductions to firms where we have connectivity. Right. Those are the things that can give people a leg up in their search versus just emailing jobs at venturefirm.com. Right. And then the last piece I talk about is I talked about going VC partners, which is our investment arm. So, you know, we're actually writing checks into startups, right? We've just invested in 20 plus companies uh, already through going VC partners. And so people in the program who have the bandwidth and they feel like they have the time to devote, they can actively get in there, source, participate in due diligence. And like I said, I think give or take about three quarters of those companies were actually sourced by members and alumni in the program. So this is not just like, oh, we have this thing and we invest like, no, we're actually doing deals that are brought to us through the people in the program. And we're taking them through a due diligence process, very similar to what you would see at a, at a venture firm, right? Like we're doing that. We're doing that work. When we were coming up, the program that was kind of like this, which it harkens back to my mind, was the Coffin Fellows Program. And I know we had a buddy in our class at Columbia, Eric Wiesen, who's now over at Bullpen, um, who got into that program. And it was hard fought. You know, the, the word on the street was you had to have an extra, a couple of master's, you know, postdoc degrees type thing. I think Eric had, was doing his second master's. He had a JD, he had an MBA, um, was a great candidate for, for that and very competitive. Um, but that was a really hard spot to get. Kaufman Fellows was very limited. How, how was this fundamentally different than Kaufman? How do you think about that? Yeah. So first thing I say before I talk about the differences, I think the Kaufman Fellowship is it's an incredible program, right? And uh, they, they've, they've been around for quite a while, as you're talking about our, our classmate, right, who I think entered in probably 2008 when we graduated. The, the differences really are, from my understanding, I'm not a, not a Kaufman Fellow is you know we are really at going vc we're focused on that accelerated educational experience and helping you get a job in venture right that's kind of the the core of of what we're doing with kaufman my understanding is it's more like um i'm sure you're familiar with uh, ypo or those kinds of membership organizations 
uh, it's a little more analogous to to that where I think it's creating these these different cohorts and, and classes and there is some programming uh, they used to be in person meetings I'm sure right um, but my understanding of Kaufman is you actually have to be employed at a venture firm or running your own fund to 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 get in it, that's my understanding I could be wrong about that yeah it was and, the case back then then the the VC firm had to sponsor you that had already decided to bet you I'll yeah, and the other big piece that's different is uh, Kaufman. Most firm firms are paying for this typically for people, right? And I don't remember the exact price point, but I think it's like mid five figures a year ish. Uh, going VC is uh, about say eight thousand dollars, and we give a variety of of scholarships. We have loan aid, et cetera, for folks who who need it as well. That's great. Now you'd mentioned an angel community on the website. I did a little scouring before the <laughs> the pod here. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so with Going VC Partners, the way we invest today is we, through the program and the members and alums, et cetera, this is how we 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 source and, and diligence companies. And then when it comes to investment, what we do is uh, very similar to what you might see in terms of uh, like an angelist syndicate. We actually spin up for each of these investments uh, a syndicate, and then Going VC Angels; those are folks who are in essence high net worth individuals who are interested in investing in the deal flow that we bring them. And so they're not obligated at all to invest in anything if they don't want to, but mm-hmm. that's in essence how we, whatever allocation we may may get in terms of an investment, uh, you know, most of that is being filled out by, by going VC uh, angels. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Is that actually managed on AngelList? No, so we, we've built our own engine to, to do mm-hmm. all that. So. We use Assure for a lot of the back office and right. sort of SBV formation stuff. We, we actually don't use AngelList at all. And we made a really conscious decision around that to kind of grow it ourselves. And it's worked, what was it's worked pretty well. Uh, on AngelList? Yeah, I mean, I think AngelList, I think, is a, a place that perhaps you would go to build audience, right? They, they have some abilities to promote people. And there's just a lot of investors already there. Because of what I had built with my newsletter over the years, and then kind of in a way uh, spinning out—I'm not officially spinning out, but you know, going VC is kind of a spin out in a way of my my newsletter. We already felt we had the reach to be able to build our own network because AngelList takes carry, right? If they bring you investors and all these different things, so I think it might have early on we we might have been able to do like bigger checks, maybe potentially. But I think in the long term, it's a good strategic decision to really kind of own our, our destiny there. And, you know, who knows, like we, we have a pretty good process and operation around that, it, you know, to, to scale that out, to perhaps help other folks run their own syndicates at some point, we don't have any definite plans around that, but that, that, you know, could be something that we, we could look into in the future because we built that, built that machine. Very interesting. So look, you, how long have you been doing VC? It's been over a decade, right? It's been going on for a while. Well, I started the blog in 08. And then going VC was founded, uh, the, you know, education business, et cetera, was founded in, um, I guess it was 2016. Okay. It's more recent than I thought. Um, the market's changed a lot since then for VC, how people operate, the number of firms, the whole thing's ch- shifting big time. How have you had to adapt the curriculum? How is it? How are, what, what trends are you seeing evolve, kind of emerge from the educational standpoint as you kind of relay this to the new folks entering the space? Yeah, one thing that we've we've been spending time on, which if you rewind to back when we were going into venture, the topic of fundraising and how to raise a fund, mm-hmm. that would be something that in 2008, we'd say, yeah, maybe we'll be doing that in 10 years, right? It just didn't, you know, the, the industry was just much smaller. But now what we're seeing is there are VCs who are raising funds. There are entrepreneurs who are raising funds. There are uh, folks who are you know, sort of in- influencer types, right? Who are raising funds, and so there's just so many more uh, avenues uh, and types of people, and also sources of capital now, right? That <clears throat> it's not unreasonable. It's hard, but it's not unreasonable for someone with maybe a limited track record but a great story to actually put together a a, a two million dollar fund and kind of get into business. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a different world. And part of that is because of Angelus, which you just mentioned. They really facilitated a lot of those micro funds to get in business. But a lot of the LPs out there, institutional, have figured out that they're going to fund those for farm teams, for high yield. 
So there's there's a whole machine around that. I agree. Uh, and it just seems to endlessly go earlier and earlier in the institutionalization of the uh, the capital stack for venture. What, um, you know, you've been watching this industry for a while, and I think you have an interesting vantage point because you're, you're trying to teach something. You're forced to think a little bit differently about it, how to communicate it and structure it. What's broken about the VC industry now? What, what bothers you? What do you wish would change? I think it's still super hard to collaborate and form an ideal investment syndicate for a company. So an example would be if, if I saw a, a company that I was really excited about and I, I wanted to invest in that company and I'm trying to think about as an investor, who are the other folks that would really help this company grow, right? Like who else would be folks that should be on their, their cap table, right? And that exercise, even still today, even with LinkedIn and with everything that we have, it's still kind of like, oh, I was on Mark's podcast last week and he's interested in the space too and could add some value. So like, I'll send this to him, right? It's like super inefficient and there's a lot of, I benefit to startups if if the industry could kind of figure out how to really form an ideal syndicate around a specific company and also to get people involved who maybe aren't investors specifically but could add value as as, as advisors uh, angelist in their syndicates i don't think they make a big deal about this but you know somewhere in the fine print you can form a syndicate and you can carve out carry for advisors in a syndicate hmm. for a specific company right and so there's just a, like a lot of opportunity to take a lot of inefficiency out and just have these really powerful, helpful, useful syndicates that are made up of a large number of people versus being reliant on the value add that you would get from, say, a large institutional VC firm, which they do provide a lot of value in many cases, right? But I actually think that there's a world where maybe you get more mileage if it's the right 25 people who are in your syndicate and are advisors, then you might get out of an institutional firm. Uh, I'm sure institutional firm folks might, might disagree with that. And I think there are some downsides to that, but I don't know that feels like something that should be possible and it's not. Yeah. It's, it, it's hard to do. I think the little wedge of what you're talking about, we are trying to address through thunder. I don't know if you've checked out thunder yet. It's one of our pet projects, Oh, okay. but thunder, um, what it has, is has about 10% of the VCs in the country on the platform and they've filled out these really detailed profiles mm -hmm. and it's designed to match founders, angels, VCs, and LPs together based upon fit without any spam, double opt-in, all this stuff. Here's mm -hmm. one of the, the best ancillaries of it though. The best things is what you're talking about. It's this discovery and maybe remembering recollection. I can't remember of all, there's so many VC investors who is interested in what type of deal. And one of the right. things I've been using Thunder for, which you know, it's not we we built it for per se, but just to remember, I'll go back in, click on the VC tab, say Seed, New York, whatever, and I'll see a list of investors that focus on that space or that demographic, uh, and just easy to remember who to talk to, even if I'm not always going through the platform. So there there is a need for some structured data in this market, uh, but I think you're talking about with the syndicates is pretty interesting because there's not a good platform for connecting those dots yet. Now, what are you seeing? You're also living through uh, some macro changes uh, geographically, right? You know, Silicon Valley is still the nexus of innovation, but less so, way less so. Are you seeing a shift in who's applying for your VC training program? Is it increasingly international or is it shifting, changing at all? What's, what's happening? What do you see through your lens? Sure, we... Geographically, we definitely have a mix. It's still predominantly US, and I don't have a, a stat around specific how many from Europe, how many from Asia Pac, et cetera. But just anecdotally, we've had folks from Europe in the program, from London, from Australia in the program. And I think I, I would expect that to grow just given that venture is becoming somewhat uh, more globalized. The other thing which you know, the industry just uh, has, has done a, a terrible job at and is, is trying to get better, but there's still so much more work to do is around helping folks from underrepresented groups and people of color get into venture as well. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, I'm super excited about, and I think we still have a lot more work to do is our program, you know, we're, we're actually able to to reach and bring in those folks as well and become part of our program. And, you know, we'll see those folks participate 
in our program, but also work with maybe a fellowship program from Black.VC or something like that too. So I'm excited just to see that folks are really just fired up about trying to break into the industry and trying to take advantage of everything that's that's out there to to be able to do that. That's important, having onboarding strategies to help people kind of phase in with comfort. That's good. Um, so now you've got you've got another job. So you do this, but you're also at DigitalOcean, right? Yep. A day job. Kind of, yep. You know, I don't know which one's the real job. They're probably both good for you. <laughs> um, you want to tell us the Digital Ocean story? You know, it's it's one of those names that's bubbled around uh, New York so much, but I think because it's you know on the engineering side of the world in terms of the customer set, a lot of the business folks out there aren't as in touch with what's happening. We just hear it every now and then when the, in the technical circles, you know, the water cooler. You want to tell us a little bit about what they're doing and what they're up to? Yeah, and I, I have to be cognizant that uh, DigitalOcean is now a public company, so I have to mm -hmm. just uh, you know sort of stick curate to, accordingly. Right, exactly. Stick to the, the the public narrative, but you know, I, just to to sort of share some backstory, I was working on a a, a company after I left Amazon, so quit Amazon, uh, and, and basically started a, a software company with a co-founder, and this was in 2013, and I remember him building our first environment to start deploying code. And he's like, oh, I'm using DigitalOcean. And I'm like, oh, like, what's DigitalOcean? Like, I've, I've never heard of that. <laughs> and, you know, fast forward, that company, unfortunately, didn't didn't work out. And so as uh, me and my co-founder were trying to find soft landings, he ended up at Flatiron Health, which worked out really well for him. And right. then uh, one of our early customers was actually uh, DigitalOcean. And so through that and some previous relationships from VMware, basically what ended up happening is I ended up joining DigitalOcean uh, straight out of 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 ending that that last startup, and so I joined the company when I don't know exactly the employee count, but there were about three hundred people or so. Uh, ben Yuretsky was the founding CEO, was still there at that time, and yeah, it was just a a really amazing experience for me, and continues to be. I think the thing that they really do differently is really focusing on the user experience for the developer, and mm -hmm. if you look at a typical cloud product or a typical enterprise software product, there's often not a lot of uh, attention to the details around the user experience. There aren't dedicated teams who are focused on making sure that every last pixel is in the right place, right? And right. that the overall architecture in terms of like how the user flows through the journey, that that all makes sense and is really high value. And I think that's really the, that's what I view as the, the differentiator and just uh, for me, one of the biggest learnings has been working side by side with some of the best uh, UX and UI uh, folks in the business and just really learning from them, like to, to really see what does good look like in enterprise software and SaaS. And that's definitely informed some of how I think about companies and investing in that space as well. When I think about your background, I always think developer tools like you're you're always out building infrastructure for the engineering community. If I remember, where did you go to space turbonomics? Did you run the company turbonomics before uh, DigitalOcean as well? Yeah. So, uh, so, so back uh, after business school, I was in venture along with you, right? But then 2008, 2009, recession, market crash, et cetera, hit. And yeah, so, party started. Part, yeah. Or ended. <laughs> yeah, ended. Exactly. Really ended. And so, most venture firms sort of thought we're going to die on the vine. And that was really obvious. So, I reached out to my network. And one of the folks I reached out to was actually someone who I did an internship with. Uh, it was uh, Peter Bell and Neil Okio Grosso, who were at Highland Capital Partners at the time. So I'd done an internship, independent study with them in, in B school. And I just reached out. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I think I'm going to need to make a move. And it just goes to show timing is everything. They're like, yeah, we just wrote a, a Series A check into a company in Valhalla, New York. I'm in Manhattan. So it's like right there. Uh, they're focused on VMware. They sold their last company to EMC for three hundred million, and it's like five PhDs, and they need a business person. <laughs> awesome! So, and I had worked at VMware, uh, right? So, what a dream situation! Yeah, so I got super lucky on that one, and from a timing perspective, and yeah, so I joined the company. I was the first business hire. I think at that point it was the five PhDs, and then another PhD that they hired, <laughs> and so <laughs> it's a lot of PhDs, a lot of very smart folks, and right. built an amazing core technology. But the challenge was initially, what is the product? 
right? What do you wrap around that core technology that that customers are actually going to pay for? And so in the beginning, we definitely struggle to figure that out, right? Like every early stage company does, even though not many people actually talk about that. Most of them do struggle. And it was so funny overnight. I, I it was, you know, one, one weekend, the six PhD came back into the office and he said, Shmuel, Shmuel is the CEO and co-founder. He's like, I built a capacity planner. So over the weekend, he basically created a product on top of that tech stack, demoed it. And then we just started in essence, showing it to customers, shipping it. And that was the product that actually uh, generated the first revenue. And this engineer basically was like, yeah, over the weekend, like, I'm just going to see if I can hack this <laughs> together. And right. he stayed all the way, actually. So he, 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 I think he's still even there, even post exit. So over the summer, IBM purchased Turbonomic for, uh, I don't think they announced the final price, but they said it was up to 2 billion. That makes sense. Now you were there early. Usually when someone's early in a company, there's some sort of crazy story or life event. Anything wild happen early at Turbonomics? Nothing like nothing crazy that you wouldn't expect in an early stage startup. Uh, you know, you're you're trying to figure out the product, the team, how you go to market. Everything is in essence an an open question. So there was nothing outside of the normal craziness that you would have. I do remember that we were building an inside sales team early on, and that was my responsibility to do that. And I had I had no experience in building an inside sales team and was kind of figuring out as I went, we had investors who had other companies doing inside sales stuff. So they, they gave some advice, but ultimately it was really up to me to kind of figure out. <laughs> I, I do remember that we, so we could do high volume calls, like have each rep do 80 to 100 outbound dials a day. We got the software that would, would automate that and like leave recorded voicemails. And just like, it was just like super, super cheesy stuff and retrospect, would have never, never done yeah. it that way. But yeah, we were, we were a little spammy in that way. Not email spam, but yeah, I mean, we were smiling and dialing like a lot of enterprise software companies uh, back then certainly did. Got it. Okay. So, you know, with your long tenure in developer tools, what's changing in the landscape? When you look at it now, what are the major shifts happening that investors, entrepreneurs should all be thinking about? Yeah, there's a couple of things. One is, I think we're seeing now SaaS move towards more of a utility pricing model. So if you look at cloud services, AWS, et cetera, they've, they've, they, they kind of went to market early on and productized around this concept of utility pricing, but we really hadn't seen that as much in pure SaaS companies. And so I think we're seeing that more now that those, those companies are really adopting more of a pay as you go type of model, because that's what their customers are Can you asking give an example? for. Uh, yeah, sure. So you might have a storage uh, or like a maybe a database SaaS product. You could charge $10 a month for that for a fixed amount of capacity. Or you could say, instead of charging you 10 bucks, I'm just going to charge you a penny per gigabyte that you store in the database. So that second one would be an example of a utility model. Okay. Now, okay, so those are there's a shift around the business model. It sounds like it's getting more sophisticated. What are the opportunities for entrepreneurs who are looking to build, create, help support innovation? You know, where should they be playing in the infrastructure layer developer tools? Yeah, I think there's a big opportunity in, in multi-cloud. So the you know, AWS is sort of the, the big dog, right? They've been around the longest, have uh, just a, a huge, huge, huge customer base and have, have been a tremendous success by any measure. Customers do want choice though, and they have different workloads that they want to run in different clouds for, for different reasons. And there's really not a standard way to do that today. There's not a set of tools that I can point to and say like, these are the preeminent like multi-cloud management tools. And yeah, people could argue that with containerization and microservices and Kubernetes that that provides like a unified uh, layer to manage things, but it's really, really not the case. And so I think there's a lot of value in being able to deliver some kind of a experience for companies where it just makes it very easy to run your different workloads and applications in a multi-cloud way and, and kind of not have to really think about it. Because there's actually quite a bit of engineering work that goes into making an application multi-cloud today. 
Got it. So kind of building a front end layer, more or less, um, to enable that type of interaction for folks. That's awesome. That's actually very interesting. Maybe someone listening will start that. If you do, let us know. We want to write yeah, checks. Absolutely. You got a check ready. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, are there other sectors? I mean, I always think of you in the, as a developer tools guy. What else do you do you look at through the, you know, your VC lens or others? You know, what else are you interested in? So one of the other areas that I'm really interested in is the creator economy. And I know a lot of folks are talking about the creator economy and I think web three kind of gets pulled in there and uh, distribute autonomous organizations, all that stuff. Uh, YouTubers, right. That kind of, that's what people think of, I think when they hear creator economy, but yeah, definitely. The, the, the um, I actually think there's this whole other segment of the creator economy that's quite large and has kind of been ignored and has actually been there for a long, long time. So there's uh, someone named Pat Flynn who has a great podcast. It's called Smart Passive Income. And he has built this huge audience around people who are creating these very niche businesses that are really very similar to these creator businesses that you're reading about and hearing about in TechCrunch, et cetera, where they're focused on a niche. Maybe it's around uh, homeschooling. And so they'll create build an email list, create blog content. Maybe they'll do some videos. They'll create some paid information products around those things, right? And there's people in every single niche that you could imagine, and, and sometimes you know multiple people, creating these kinds of businesses. And I feel like they kind of, they've been there forever. Like Pat's been doing his podcast for, I don't even know how many years, but like that's already been a thing. It's only now with, big YouTubers, Mr. Beast, et cetera, where people are, uh, you know, saying, Hey, you know, this creator economy thing, is a thing. It's actually always been a thing. It's just that I think that whole segment has really been, been ignored. And so that's the segment I'm excited about. Cause that's, that's kind of where I play personally. I consider myself a, a creator, but in the VC space in terms of creating content and courses and, and businesses and resources specific to that space. So I'm always interested to, to look at things that, that fall in there. I'm less interested in the thing that would let, uh, say, a, a YouTuber uh, sell a sponsorship, right? That doesn't really excite me as much as how can some of these niche creators get empowered and, and really build substantial businesses. I think for every single one of these sort of creator businesses, uh, I think there's, there's like, a, like a living salary there, like for people who, who really lean into it, have the right tools, have the right support. And so I'm really excited about that area specifically in the creator economy. I think it really doesn't get talked about as much as it should. You know, I think that's coming. We're investors in two companies in the space. Uh, one is Grin. Grin helps uh, the advertisers actually engage with creators and deliver those sponsorships to make it easy. But they found that creators or advertisers to get like real authenticity of pushing the product, the creators actually have to like the product they're pushing. <laughs> Right, And so Grin does a good job of helping people build those relationships, get connects the brands, the influencers in a way that actually makes sense with kind of the human component of in product interest. And then we've got another one that we're involved with called Jelly Smack. And both of these are, I think, increasingly pretty dominant in their space as unicorns at this point, um, which really does help a lot of the top creators, I think including Mr. Beast, literally, one of their clients, uh, monetize on a whole, all, a whole litany of platforms from Facebook to everything else. But I think you're right. I think what I'm hearing from you is what's missing is the taking those technologies and those solutions and bringing them down the long tail. And that's probably a space where it's been economically inefficient for a lot of brands and advertisers to spend time curating. There's some need for some algorithmic solution to kind of tap into that. That's very interesting. And I do agree. You know, we talk all about jobs that are being destroyed through technology, but there are a lot that are being created. A lot that are being created, and the you know it's it's hard to see the creator economy as being a viable career path for a lot of folks, but it just might end up being something that a lot of people do. I think for people our age, it's kind of hard to imagine, <laughs> um, but I think it I think that's a reality. I mean, it's already happening for a small group, you know, relatively small group of people, but it might be more of a career path for folks over time. Yeah, I would never 
I would never sort of tell someone like, Hey, go like quit your job and become a creator unless they really want to. But like, but I, I think what is really achievable for almost anyone, because everyone starts at zero in this, I guess, creator economy game, right? Like you have no email subscribers, you have no YouTube followers, you have no Twitter uh, followers, right? Is if you come up with something that can deliver value for free on a repeated basis, over an extended period of time and you just stick with it and you the reason you're going to stick with it is because you actually care about it right and you care about the people you're trying to serve like it will turn into something will it turn into a 10 billion dollar business probably not uh, could it turn into something that helps you get a higher profile in your career absolutely could it be something that becomes uh a, a, a six-figure revenue stream for you that maybe you do go work on full-time at some point or maybe you don't maybe you use that as supplemental income like it is it's like wide open right now and it's super exciting and i i think that's a really important point for listeners to to hear that uh y- you can actually do this too it just you need to find the thing that you're excited about you need to put it out there and you just need to do it consistently and uh, almost not care if anyone shows up right just do it because you know you're really trying to add value to a, a small niche audience and over time it will it will develop uh, but you really have to stick with it. You really have to love doing it. And sometimes it does take some time to figure out who is it you want to serve, right? And how do you want to serve them? Totally. You know, interesting. I th- said this before on this podcast, but my real motivation for doing this podcast is to learn. I want to get people like you on and I want to grill you. I want to ask you all the questions that I wouldn't ask you over lunch because it'd be a little awkward. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, uh, I, I'm, you know, Interplay's mission and kind of the mission I live on that gives me kind of some, you know, a dose of meaning in my work is to really help entrepreneurs be more successful because I believe they're the change makers of society. But this, this I don't, wouldn't be doing this podcast if it was a content play. Right? This, this for me is learning. Uh, and I, I think, it's, you know, when I started, everyone was like, you have to stick with it or it's a waste of time. So I think you do, you're right on. You have to have something that you actually care about that you want to do for the sake of doing it. Uh, otherwise, it's just hard to sustain. I want to throw uh, a curveball at you. All right. It, for folks listening now, we're recording this towards the end of January uh, 22. And the whole world's heating up right now around Russia and China against the West. Um, what do you think happens to the tech community if we stumble into another mass, mass scale foolish war? Yeah, that's definitely a curveball. And you're welcome. I, yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I don't have a strong opinion or vision around that. But what I would say is, I think with China in particular, that you know, Ch- China is clearly a geopolitical force and, and maybe they're in a position to sort of become the, the number one, if, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. One way I think we'll see that kind of come into the, the venture and startup space is, you know, you think about the firms right in the us right like uh any of the brand names really you think about a sequoia or a kleiner uh, a lightspeed right so what you see is they've, they've become very successful in the in the us and then they start to bridge out internationally right so sequoia might have or lightspeed might have an india fund for example or a china fund and i think we in the next i would say five to ten years we'll see actually Chinese firms enter the US and be as dominant, as competitive for the best deals as are the Sequoias, the A16Zs, the Red Points, et cetera. So I think that's regardless of sort of the, the geopolitical climate, I would not be surprised at all to see a dynamic like that in the next five to 10 years and where entrepreneurs are actually seeking out and choosing those firms over some of those Silicon Valley stalwarts. Yeah, venture capital has been an American product to date. We export it. Other firms have popped up around the world, but it's mainly been an American thing so far. I totally agree with you that that's changing. We're already starting to see a lot of other firms in the States from abroad, and their value prop that they're selling to the entrepreneurs is like, look, take our money and we'll help you bridge your business into our geography. And there's a lot of that coming from China already. None of them carry the brand weight that you're talking about. But I agree with you. It's probably an inevitability. Very interesting. Um, 
Um, where, where do you think we're at? You know, we're we're seeing some bumps in the stock market right now. Uh, very often, I get asked by LPs, um, "How does the venture ecosystem and correlate with the public market? What do you think is happening at a macro level with the public market, and do you think we're going to fill it in the startup world?" On the public market stuff, if you rewind, let's call it a year and a half, two years ago, and I don't know if you saw this in in your investing, but as the market started to heat up, the the, the public markets, the the early stage valuations actually stayed pretty, yeah, you know, I would say normalish, right? Now they're not in the sense, right? You're seeing them things really getting priced up at the earliest stages, but now there's this correction. I think what will happen is those seed valuations, those early stage valuations will start to trend down. I don't think it's going to be tomorrow, but assuming we sort of stay in this uh, place we are now with some inflation fears and maybe the Fed's going to do some stuff, right? I think that we'll start to see those valuations trend a little bit further back to where they might have been two years ago. Uh, will they go all the way back? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I think that if you're doing early stage stuff, right, you're not expecting to get any money out for, say, seven to 10 years, right? If at all, <laughs> assuming the thing exits and, and you actually can can make a return. So that's a long time for a stock market to go through a sub- couple cycles to correct, to recorrect, et cetera. So I'm not, I'm not super concerned with that specifically. I think you just have to be in the market. You still have to be playing the game. And over time, you'll benefit from that, that dollar cost averaging, if you will. I think for the VCs out there, you know, when the market crashes, there's a denominator effect for the big institutional LPs where there's suddenly overweighted venture. And they deploy less capital to VC firms. VCs slow down a little bit, but um, and that could affect valuations and shakes out some of the companies that maybe shouldn't be getting funded. But we have a lot of capital in the market now. I think there's this interesting perspective that I heard recently on why the valuations have popped so much. That actually takes it away a little bit from hype, this hype concept or overfunding of the market. The argument I heard is if you look back. Last five to 10 years, not a lot of companies were exiting, right? So there was no real way to understand or really kind of value the back end valuations of the best companies in your portfolio, the unicorns, because they never got sold. There's no com- few companies too big enough to buy them, and the public markets seem to be closed to new, uh, to new business. And then obviously, we had this flood of the last two years of all the companies going out, going, IPOing, tons of liquidity, and now we're able to mark up and see those valuations. So through all of that, suddenly you've got VCs that have performed above the normal returns. So you've got like inflation of prices, tracking in a bunch more capital. So there's an argument that the price correction where the valuations have gone up is actually appropriate. Because what it's implying is that early stage valuations had actually been undervalued because we didn't know what the companies would be worth at exit. Now that we know that, and we've seen that the value, you know, the returns have been too high for venture. Increases supply of capital, brings down the returns, because valuations are going up at the early stage. Uh, and the concept is that this is a, we're just witnessing a, a delayed shift, and this is actually appropriate, an appropriate valuation market. I don't know exactly where it's going to land. There's a whole bunch of other conf- uh, confounding factors. But it does bring some sanity back to the, what I'm seeing. And also, uh, that concept made me glad I, was take, I took macroeconomics in college. Otherwise, that class kind of <laughs> felt like a waste. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Does that resonate with you, or does that sound like it's someone trying to <laughs> rationalize paying up? No, I, I had not heard that argument. It makes sense. The other thing too is the winners are so much bigger now, too, right? Like right. you know, in in back when we were you know eight oh nine, I I feel like if you thought a company you could get you know ten to twenty x, you'd be like, yeah, amazing. You know, like let's let's take a look at that right now you're looking at where can I get 100x, right? And the thing is, companies are actually, right, seed stage investment, people are getting 100x on those. Now, granted, those are the best companies, right? But it's totally a possibility. You know, you're seeing people, you see a, a, an institutional fund get something that's 100x, right? They're going to probably do 5 or 6x on the whole fund, right? Which is, I mean, that's that's great, right? That That's venture capital when it works. 100%. John, hey, great to reconnect. Thank you for being on. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of all things that kind of accelerate innovation. You know, I, deep down, I just hope a, l- a lot of it's going to have major positive social impact. 
So the idea that you're out training a lot of would-be VCs to help spread innovation, bring it around the world, that's awesome. That's awesome. I know you're, you're interested and you're passionate about it. I know there's an economic incentive, but that's a great cause. I love that. So thanks, thanks for being Mark. on. Absolutely. This was a ton of fun. And yeah, it's been great to catch up. You know, obviously I used to see you almost every day at business school uh, many moons ago. <laughs> so we don't get to do this very often. So really excited to be here. Moons. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. A lot of moons. <laughs> All right. All right, my man. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Mark. I'll see you. So I love what John's doing. It's very on mission for me and in Interplay. Helping people find their way into the innovation economy, I believe to be important because innovation, as we know, is what drives forward society. This is where I ask you to help out. If you like what you heard, please give us like, five-star review, whatever. Push those buttons. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any major podcast platform. Just search for Innovation with Mark Peter Davis.